You know, these owners spend, well, the taxpayers spend billions of dollars building these stadiums. And then you wonder, how much are they spending on the actual field? And there are certain stadiums that have a bad reputation. And MetLife, where the Jets and Giants play, has a bad reputation. Uh, you just had uh, one of the Giants, Sterling Shepard, who's out for the year. OBJ tweeted out about that field as well. Albert Breer's been covering this story. Albert, uh, how who is the one who signs off on the quality of a football field when, when stadiums are built or even a week-by-week -week basis of, are these playable or are these safe? Well, the NFL teams, um, you know, really – like are, are charged with maintaining that obviously during the year. And then the league office has people that approve the fields. Um, you know, Dan, I think there's a bigger systemic problem here for the NFL, which is the stadiums have gotten so expensive that NFL owners feel like they can't justify having those stadiums for just 10 dates a year. And so what does that mean? That means we got to put a million events in there. We got to put rodeos and tractor poles and, you know, swim meets and all of this different stuff in those stadiums. And what you find is when you put a ton of different events in these stadiums, it becomes harder to maintain a grass field. So what do they do? They put down field turf. Um, it's happened even in places like Carolina, like where you look like Charlotte, North Carolina should be ideal for growing grass, right? But they have a turf field. Why? Well, because they put a soccer team in there. They want to have more events in there. They want to try to monetize the stadium. So a lot of this comes down to money and it comes down to money on the other end too, which is, are you familiar with the Packers surface? Well, I was there when Favre played where it was basically painted a dirt. Okay. Well, what they have now is like this, it's like this synthetic, it's like a blend, right? Like it's, it's synthetic natural grass blend. It's very expensive. It's very hard to maintain. It's, I mean, it takes a lot of resources, right? All the European soccer clubs use it, um, which tells you like that something's working over there. And then if you look at the Packers, can you think of like a lot of injuries that have happened at Lambeau, despite the fact that they're in northern Wisconsin, which would be a, a really tough environment to do this, right? Yeah. Yeah. See, so there there is a solution there. And I think more and more players are asking, well, why aren't more teams doing what the Packers are doing? And why would the Packers be able to do this and other teams wouldn't? Well, there's no owner there to say no, right? Like, so you sort of add all of this up. And you know, I had a really interesting conversation with Nick Bosa about this, um, you know, over the summer. And he obviously tore his ACL on that turf at MetLife. And, you know, he said to me, like, flat out, he says, it's BS that, that they're making us all play on field turf. Uh, you know, he's like, we should be playing on natural grass the same way soccer players in Europe are. He brought up European soccer players. So um, look, the NFLPA's president, JC Treaders brought this up. Um, you know, Nick Bosa again brought it up to me. I know he's very cognizant of the surfaces he plays on. If you look at the way the Rams have done business, despite the fact they play on field turf um, in their stadium, like Sean McVay and that staff, they won't let their players practice on on fields that they don't feel like are very high level. Um, for practices, this has happened. This has been an issue for them with joint practices over the years. Um, so there are a lot of people that are very cognizant of it, and um, I think there are a lot of players out there that do, that do feel like this is the owners trying to cut corners and make more money. Okay, so what's the solution here? Can you could Bosa sue MetLife Stadium? Like, can can Sterling Shepard sue because of the actual playing surface? <laughs> My guess is no, because I don't think the NFL would leave that. And I don't know for a fact, but I mean, I, I would think that that is um, tied up in collective bargaining, which is, you know, part of why the NFL PA has a hand in approving the fields. Um, and, you know, I, I, I just, I, I don't think Dan, that it's necessarily that there's not the right process in place for approving the fields. I think what most players are saying now, a lot of players are saying now is that the bar isn't high enough. You know, like the process is in place to approve the fields, but is the standard for our fields too low? And I think it's very easy, again, for a lot of these players to look overseas and say, how come you see these soccer teams over in Europe doing all of this to protect their players and our teams and our owners aren't? And I think it's a very fair question to ask. Now, like in some circumstances, indoor stadiums, I like – I understand like why, like you feel like maybe you have to have field turf, but even in those cases, like look at Arizona and Vegas, right? Like Arizona and Vegas have those 
trays that pull the field outside so you can have you can grow grass outside. Well, why wouldn't an owner want to do that? Do you know what that costs an owner? Costs an owner parking, right? Like so Arizona and Vegas, like I mean, it's great that they're doing it, but one one thing I think for a lot of owners, one thing with a lot for a lot of owners I think would look at that and say well, that's going to cost me X amount of parking spots, which is X amount of revenue over the course of a year. And when you add it up and you're trying to put all these events in a stadium, whether it's you know NFL games, soccer games, concerts, whatever it is, like you're going to cost yourself X amount of money. A lot of owners just aren't willing to do that. We're talking Albert Breer, senior NFL reporter, lead content strategist at the Monday Morning Quarterback. What did you see on the Tua play and then the subsequent events Sure. It looked really bad. I mean, like, look, like, you know, Matt Milano, um, you know, obviously was flagged for the the hit to his head bounces off the turf. Um, I mean, like he almost looked like a woozy drunk, like getting up, like, and that's like sort of like, I think what we all associate with head injuries, right? Like in the way that he kind of stumbled to the ground and it looked really, really bad. And I was very skeptical in the moment. Obviously the dolphins pushed out, the back injury narrative very quickly, like in game, they pushed that narrative out there after they'd previously announced that he was being evaluated for a head injury at this point though, Dan, like it's just, it's something very sinister would have to be at work for this still to be for, for, for them still to be covering something up because like, you'd have to have people, the league office, people in the dolphin staff, people, um, the independent, um, you know, concussion spotter, um, Tua himself, like there would have to be so many people complicit at this point in covering this thing up. I just think it's more likely that this was a like it's just a bad coincidence where Tua really did have a back injury and um and 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 his head happened to bounce off the turf and that he tweaked his back that way. Um, you know, I again like I, I think it's right to be skeptical, and the NFL's made its bet on this. Um, over the years, it's right to be skeptical on all sorts of concussion issues when it comes to the NFL. And it's great that the NFL PA is looking into this. It's just hard for me to imagine that there would be that many people at this point that would sign off on keeping Tua out of the concussion protocol with a Thursday night game coming. Um, like a lot of people would be putting themselves at risk in doing that to try to cover this but, up. But this, this is another thing. It's like, he didn't have a concussion, but he had something to do with his back that made him react that way, Albert. Right. That right. sounds like it might be a little more serious, but nobody's like, what is the back injury here? It's, he didn't have a concussion. Okay, but is there something else here that we're, hey, right. don't, don't look over here. We're just going to let you know that he didn't have a concussion. Right. And I, I mean, that's definitely a question. And look, like that's just sort of, I think that's the way these things have gone, right? Like over the last 15 years is that, you know, we've all been sort of trained and uh, they've made great progress when it comes to head injuries. I mean, they, they were coming from a really low point, yeah. no question, but, but they've made progress when it comes to head injuries. And I think we've all been sort of trained in our head to think football players can play through everything else but head injuries now. It used to be football players play through everything, right? And now it's like football players play through everything but head injuries. And I mean, look, like we sort of glorify that to some degree, right? Like we glorify when a guy goes out there and he's able to kind of fight through something. I think we've stopped glorifying it with head injuries, but we glorify it with everything else. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's probably part of just our, the culture of the way we like follow the sport. We cover the sport now where it's like, don't make a guy a hero for playing through a head injury, but make him a hero for playing through everything else. Yeah. And accept that just that's the nature of the sport that you have to play through everything else. I meant, mentioned this early. You got uh, Baltimore facing Buffalo, big showdown here. Uh -huh. And I keep hearing this week in and week out, Lamar Jackson bet on himself and just like Aaron Judge did. But I don't know... Like, what is the end game for Lamar Jackson? What is he hoping to get that he didn't get? How much? It feels like there's a finite amount of money yeah. that he can get. Is it is it the guarantee or is it a Mahomesian type of deal? Well, let me let me just position this in an interesting way to you, where maybe it's not totally about the money for Lamar. Um, he has played. He, he has run the ball at a historic rate over the first four years of his career, right? And they deploy him in a way that no quarterback, even Cam Newton, um, has been deployed, uh, I mean, in modern NFL history. Um, no one's ever done this with a quarterback before. 
And last year, for the first time, that actually took him off the field. His first three years, it didn't, right? And as much as like there might have been mileage put on his body and everything else, it didn't take him off the field. Last year, for the first time, it took him off the field. He missed five games. So I think most of us would look at that, and most players too would look at that and say, God, Lamar, you should really cash out. You know, like just take what you can get now because something more serious could happen. What if Lamar looks at it the other way? What if Lamar looks at it because he's always thought differently? We know he's a different guy. It's part of what it makes him great. What if Lamar looks at this and says, you know what? I'm not going to mitigate your financial risk. Look at the amount of physical risk I'm taking on. I'm not mitigating your financial risk four, five, six years from now. Like if you guarantee the first three years of my deal, that means that you are giving yourself outs in the three or four years after that. And if this is part of the bargain that I've got to take on this amount of physical risk to play this position, and there's no precedent for a quarterback taking on the physical risk that I'm taking on, hell no, <laughs> I'm not going to mitigate your, your financial so risk. So this is just, he does he want a Deshaun Watson, $230 and I think it's million? Principle, but I, but I, think, I, think, I mean, Dan, like, like my read, I think there's principle involved here, right? I think he wants like, I, I and look, like what I can tell you is 100% what you're saying. Like, this is not about that. Like one thing I know is this is not about raw dollars. Like last year, they were willing to go to the Josh Allen number. This year, they've been willing to go up over forty-five million per, which is where the market is right now. This is not about the raw money. This is about doing guarantees and structures, yeah. uh, guarantees and structure in a different way than we've traditionally seen quarterbacks done, which is what Deshaun Watson got right, and which what what Kirk Cousins got. Um, five years ago or four years ago in Minnesota. And Lamar's asking the Ravens to, I think Lamar's asking the Ravens to do that without there being multiple bidders, which is the difference in the Cousins situation and the Watson situation from every other one, right? Cousins and Watson had multiple bidders, which I think is why it got to the point that it got to in those cases. Um, so like, but I don't think that this is just about like Lamar collecting every every dollar. If it was to me, if this was really about money, the Ravens would have been able to find the number that Lamar couldn't say no to, because that's what this is really about, right? At some point, the number would have gotten to a point where Lamar would have said, you know what, $150 million, that's good enough, I'll do it. To me, like, and just knowing a little bit about Lamar, knowing about NFL precedent, I just, it feels to me like this is about principle. And if you really think about it, you sort of reverse engineer it that way, Dan, where you say to yourself, if you're Lamar, might you be a little ticked off if you're taking on the, all this physical risk and they're asking to mitigate your financial risk? You can see where maybe he would think that way. Yeah, I wondered about if you guarantee it. Um, but so you think the Ravens are saying, you know, we sort of want to guarantee this. We don't want to yeah. complete. Okay. And well, so so here's the thing is like, and, and and really the reason why things aren't this way. So I remember talking to you know a few teams after Kirk Cousins did his deal, and I remember asking like, "Is this going to be the trendsetter? Is this like the the tide turner, you know, so to speak?" And they all said, "It's and, and agents too." They all said like, "It just depends on what the next contracts look like." And then Matt Ryan did a conventional quarterback deal, and Aaron Rodgers did a conventional quarterback deal, and we were back to square one, right? And same thing happened this year, where you know Deshaun Watson does his deal in March. And everybody's like, oh, cool. Could this be the trendsetter? And well, Kyler Murray, Derek Carr, uh, they do conventional quarterback deals after um, after after Deshaun Watson's deal gets done. And it seems like we're back to square one. So like I the, what the Ravens were asking Lamar to do was a conventional quarterback deal, which is where things had sort of reset after the Deshaun Watson deal. And it feels to me at least like he's the first person to stand on principle in this. And what's really interesting about Dan, I had a discussion with a really smart executive a couple of years ago who was in a quarterback negotiation about this. And he said to me, he said, my job isn't to pay him what he thinks he's worth. My job isn't to pay him what the market says he's worth. My job is to find the number he can't say no to. And that's effectively what the mm -hmm. Raiders were able to do with Carr. That's effectively what the Cardinals were able to do with Kyler Murray. And obviously, that's something the Ravens haven't been able to do with Lamar. I'll uh, get to this quickly and let you go. Thank you again for your time. Uh, you got it. The Giants situation with Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley, I think they've already 
kind of sent the message to Daniel yeah. Jones. Hey, we're not picking up your option. Saquon, do you want to get into the let's extend a running back to a second contract here? I mean, this is a faceless team without those two, but I wonder as they move past this season, are Saquon Barkley and Daniel Jones on the Giants? I'll say no on Daniel Jones. Um, I'll say maybe on Saquon Barkley. I think with Barkley, it sort of depends on what the market dictates. And my guess would be that the Giants would let him go to the market and say, we'll work with you on a contract, but like we're not going to break the bank at this point because he is a running back five years in and he does have injury history now. And I think it's it's really instructive because I do think that they followed the pattern um, through their first nine months there. Like it's instructive to look at like where Joe Shane and, and Brian Dayball came from, and that's Buffalo. And if you look at the way that the Bills built what they've built there, and I think everybody's impressed with what they've built there, they did have sort of faces of the franchise when they got there, right? And Tyrod Taylor was there, and Kyle Williams on defense was there. And they slowly transitioned out from underneath those guys. And if you look at that team now, look at the core of the team. Every single one of them is a Sean McDermott, Brandon Bean guy. Every single one of them, right? So, so much of what Buffalo did, they had good players in house. They made the playoffs that first year, was about how do we transition out of the old era and into the new era? And so I think it's going to be a big, going to be a big part of what the Giants do. And the same way McDermott and Bean had confidence in themselves that they'd be able to bring in the right guys over time, which they did. And guys like Josh Allen and Tredavious White and Tremaine Edmonds and Stefan Diggs and all of those guys, Micah Hyde, Jordan Poyer. Um, I think the that, that Shane and Dayball have the same sort of confidence that they're going to find a way to bring in the right kind of guys to be the faces of their franchise a couple of years from now. Final 30 seconds. Is there a coach right now already in trouble? I mean, the conversation is going to continue on Matt Rule and, and Mike McCarthy, um, I think, over the course of the year. McCarthy's, I think, done himself a favor in winning with Cooper Rush um, the last couple of weeks. So, you know, I, I don't know that that discussion is quite as hot as it was um, a couple of weeks ago um, on Mike McCarthy. It, Rule is just going to have to deal with it over the course of this year. Um, so that's one. And then I think another one to watch is, is Lovey Smith and Houston. They're at such a critical point for their franchise. And, and I, it's hard to predict a, a franchise will go one and done two years in a row. But you've got names like Josh McCown and Jonathan Gannon that sort of have connections in the organization. And I, I think I'll be sort of hovering over that thing. What about Cliff um, Kingsbury? He just signed through 2027. Though. I know. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm shocked that they did it. I mean, that was the thing is that that was the bigger surprise was that they did those contracts. And, you know, I think we all came out of that blowout loss, the Rams thinking, okay, Cliff's on notice, Steve Kimes on notice, even Kyler might be on notice. All those guys have new deals now. <laughs> and, you know, I think a big part of it becomes it's not just as the owner willing to eat all that money if he fires guys or gets rid of guys who have these contracts. It's also admitting you were wrong. You know what I mean? Like, and it was such a big swing on Cliff in the first place in 2019. And they made the playoffs last year and they've made progress over three years. Like you, 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 you make that decision, you make the progress, you double down. If you're Michael Bidwell, are you willing to admit mm. that you were wrong? I think that's a big part of it. And I think that could be a factor in the rule thing too. I mean, honestly, like David Tepper took a, awfully big swing in giving Matt rule a seven year contract, um, you know, in 2020, when does he get to the point where he's willing to admit he's wrong? I think that's a factor in these sorts of situations where coaches have so much term left on their contracts. Thanks again, Albert. You got Dan. That's Albert Breer. He is the Monday morning quarterback. MMQB.com. We'll take a break. Phone calls coming up. Close up shop after this. 